All right, good morning. I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation and for hosting this wonderful conference at ICTS. Um, I'm going to talk about outliers for products of independent random matrices, and this is all joint work with uh, Natalie Costin and Sean O'Rourke. Sean's at uh, Colorado University Boulder, and Natalie was a graduate student there and now is a practicing data scientist. So let me get started. This is, will look a little familiar. So those of you who've seen other talks at this conference, I'm going to talk about the circular law. Um, so what we see here are three or eigenvalues of three matrices. Uh, all of them are each is a thousand by thousand matrix with IID entries scaled by one of root n. The first is Rademacher plus minus one, so all the entries are plus one or minus one, with probability one half. The next in green is uh, Gaussian normal. This is, if you look carefully, you can tell it's real Gaussian normal because it's symmetric across the x-axis. And last is uh, exponential, that's a non-negative random variable with mean one, variance one. And you look at these three things and you think, okay, there's, there's a pattern. They all look like they spread out very nicely and uniformly on the disk. And uh, that is indeed uh, a result, a theorem. Um, so this is the, called the circular law. And if M is an n by n random matrix with entries that are IID complex random variables, mean zero and variance one, then the eigenvalues of one over root n times M, uh, that measure converges weakly to the uniform distribution of the unit disk. And this, um, as we heard from Arub Bose and David Benfew, the ideas in this go back a ways. One of the critical ideas is bounding the smallest singular value. Um, and another idea um, came from, uh, from Gurko, this idea of the uh, log potential or hermitization, where you can, instead of studying eigenvalues, you can study singular values, which are much better behaved. But the cost you pay is you study singular values of a family of random matrices parameterized by Z, a complex number, instead of just eigenvalues of a single matrix. Um, and so, as these things go, the easiest case was complex Gaussian that was done uh, in the 60s by Meta, or maybe formalized by Silverstein and Huang a little later. Um, and then the real Gaussian case was done by Alan Edelman. And it continued the ideas of Gurko, then uh, Pan and Zhao and Gutz and Tikamorov um, improved each time, you know, getting closer to this, this moment condition, just second moment bounded. You know, the, the first they had many moments bounded or, or continuous distributions. And they eventually whittled this down into this final result, which uh, which appeared in a paper by Talon Vu with an appendix by, by Krishnapur um, that, that proved the result in this form. And in this form, this is not the best you can do, of course. Uh, if you notice, this exponential case has mean one. It's not covered by this. So there are even extensions beyond uh, what you see here for the circular law. Um, one thing I'll point out about this, and this goes back a little bit to what David Renfrey was saying, what this convergence means, so convergence in this case, it means there's an integral of a test function of, uh, of the measure of the uh, eigenvalues. So this is the, the empirical spectral distribution here. And you're comparing that integration against the empirical distribution to the integral of the same function, but now over this non-random measure And this here is the uniform on the unit disk, in this case. And the thing about this quantity is that it doesn't see microscopic features. I, I'll tell you it's true, and maybe you'll believe me later. You could worry that there are some eigenvalues outside of the disk, some of that didn't show up in the picture, maybe five or six of them, some small constant number, and this in this integral, because this is, this is a sum, the, the measure is, gives 1 over n measure to each eigenvalue, because of this 1 over n, if there were you know, a, a constant number of eigenvalues that were off the picture, they would disappear from this sum and then would, would not be visible to the, to the limiting measure. And so this kind of limiting result doesn't see microscopic features. It doesn't see, for example, how nicely spread out the eigenvalues are inside the disk. If you just plot it to 1,000 random points, they're much more clumpy and they're much bigger gaps. But eigenvalues of random matrices have this repulsion effect where they're very nicely spread out. That's also not seen by the circular law. But today I want to talk about one of these microscopic features. And another one you might notice is it really looks like there are not any eigenvalues appreciably far outside the disk. If you look really carefully, I don't know if it's even possible to see, there are a few, like here, so maybe a few little eigenvalues that have you know, bounced out of the disk here. But they're very close. And in fact, you can show with standard techniques, if you assume that the fourth moment is is finite, so it's an additional assumption over the circular law, 
then the spectral radius converges to one almost surely as n goes to infinity. And this is by a truncation method and the moment method, similar to what Bordenov was describing yesterday. Um, and if you, so you can show that in fact this microscopic feature is true. There are no eigenvalues appreciably far away from the disk as n gets bigger and bigger. And that's, uh, that's the kind of microscopic feature I want to talk about today. In particular, if you perturb this picture a little bit, you can sometimes have eigenvalues escape from the disk and in certain cases can predict where they'll be and, and, uh, and, and say a little bit about even their fluctuations, though I won't get to that uh, in this talk today. So let's talk about those perturbations. So we're going to take one of these IID matrices uh, M. Uh, in this case, for this picture, you'll see on this slide, they'll all be plus minus one Rademacher matrices of various sorts. And there'll be a fixed matrix P. P is our perturbation matrix. It'll be the same for each picture. P is a diagonal matrix with three non-zero values, three I over two, one plus I, and two. All the rest of the matrix is zero. So it's rank three. It has uh, operator norm, I guess, three halves, or no, operator norm two, because of the two there. And um, the, one of the uh, uh, first outlet results was due to Terrence Tao in 2013. It looked at this, whoops, ah, come back. This IID matrix M added P to it and, and was able to show that in this particular case, uh, when I plotted here in these red X's, these three red X's are the eigenvalues of P itself. And if you look closely by each red X, there's a little blue circle for the corresponding outlier. And so Tau's result says that in the case of this finite fourth moment, the eigenvalues of P are mapped to eigenvalue, approximately mapped to eigenvalue outliers uh, of the whole, whole matrix. And those are the only outliers that you see when adding this perturbation. Um, so that's, that is the a first outlier result here. And um, you saw a glimpse of this. Here's another one. So this is a different kind of, uh, random matrix. Let me first describe what M mu is. So M mu is uh, IID Rademacher, so again, plus minus one, but it's symmetric to start with. This is why it's not, the, you know, the, if you look at this, you see the bulk distribution, it's not a disk, it's this ellipse. Why is it an ellipse? Well, I'll explain. So it starts as a plus minus one symmetric matrix. That should have real spectrum, but then in the lower, in the lower triangle, multiply each entry independently by minus one. And this is just in the lower triangle. And so uh, this is width of probability, uh, width probability one fourth. So you go through each entry in the lower triangle, three fourths of the time you leave it the same, and one fourth of the time you multiply by negative one. So that leaves a matrix where there is a covariance between each pair uh, upper triangular and lower, tri if you take an entry, entry to the upper triangle, lower triangle, uh, there's a, a positive correlation between them, but they're not, it's not symmetric and it's not uh, IID, and in that particular case, be based on the covariance, you get an ellipsoid shape. And so that elliptical law, uh, the bulk, bulk convergence, the elliptical law, the first results were due to Namov on that. And that had uh, conditions of all the moments being bounded. And then uh, a little later, um, Hoi Ng Wen and Sean O'Rourke, um, this in 2014, they proved the elliptic law uh, in, with minimal conditions. So this is in general, the general elliptic law. And that said that you would get this ellipsoid shape for the bulk. What Abrook and Renfrew did is took the next, the next step looking at a microscopic feature, first showing that if you don't perturb the elliptic random matrix, you have a general no outliers. And second, if you perturb it by adding this matrix P, you do get outliers. And um, there are a few nice features I like about this result. Uh, so this, I guess I should say what mu is. Mu in this case, mu is the uh, covariance. So mu in this case is one half, it's the covariance. Uh, of the pairs of, of uh, entries in the upper and lower triangle. And what they show is that this, for any covariance, for any covariance mu, that you get a different kind of ellipsoidal shape and different placement of the outliers. And so if you set mu equal to zero, they, uh, a rogue entry recovers tau's result. And if you set mu equal to positive one, it recovers an outlier result for Hermitian random matrices. Um, and that's recovers of all the Renfrew and Shoshnikov from uh, 2012. The other thing I like about this is you notice the red X's mark where the 
eigenvalues of p are, and the outliers are not exactly there. Because of the, the random, because of the features of the, the limiting distribution, the, I, the idealized placement of the outliers is at the centers of these green circles, and you can see each of them capture the blue outlier. And um, in the elliptic case with this covariance, the generally, generally the outliers are sort of compressed in the complex axis and spread out in the real axis, and that you have a different placement for the, the outliers because of that. Um, I'll describe one more outlier result. This is uh, for sample covariance matrices. So a sample covariance matrix, you start with the same ID Rademacher matrix M, take its transpose and multiply it again by itself. So this way you end up with a uh, Hermitian matrix. The scaling factor you need is 1 over N. If you have no perturbations, this is a Marchinko Pasteur law. So all the eigenvalues are real. They're on this real line. And there's a, you know, if you plotted a, a density histogram, you get a well known Marchinko Pasteur shape. What we are interested in here is uh, perturbing this and seeing if there would be outliers. And so we used a multiplicative perturbation. So we multiplied the sample covariance matrix by the identity plus the same matrix P. And it gives a, a more complicated rule for where the outliers start. The red axes are where the eigenvalues of P are. Each does correspond to an outlier, but the outliers are, are moved by this function. So if P has an eigenvalue at lambda j, the outlier that shows up in this multiplicative perturbation is lambda j times 1 plus 1 over lambda j. And in these two results here, one of the key steps was an isotropic limit law, uh, which is a generalization of a local limit law. Um, and it essentially would say that a certain resolvent is approximated by a simple function in any basis. And we'll see later in this talk uh, an example of what one of those laws are, is. Um, O'Rourke and Renfrew proved an isotropic limit law for elliptical matrices on their own. For, for the sample covariance case, um, Sean Rourke and I, we used uh, an isotropic lim limit law due to um, Blomendahl, Erdős, Knowles, Yao, and Yin. Uh, they, had, they had proven uh, isotropic limit law that we could adapt and use in this context to get the outliers result. So these are some things about outliers. That's one of the topics of the one of the parts of the talk. We want to talk about uh, products. Before I go on, I'll say one more thing. In all of these perturbations, again, the bulk distribution. Uh, in, the, in the sense of the circular law distribution, that uh, the limiting measure is not changed. The bulk distribution is the same, but this microscopic, microscopic feature of the outlier aggregate values does change. OK, so we want to talk about also products. So um, I will first talk about a result, products of independent elliptical matrices. This is kind of state of the art for products of independent matrices. Um, and the first results were not about elliptical matrices. Uh, but just matrices of the IID sort, where all the entries were independent and identically distributed. Goetz and Tikhomorov in 2011, and then Oroch and Shoshnikov, uh, also in 2011, um, proved a limiting bulk distribution for these products of a finite number, a uh, fixed number of IID matrices. And I want to talk about a generalization of this um, to elliptic random matrices. So you've seen one elliptic random matrix. That was this M mu. That was this Rademacher elliptic matrix. And there's a general form for those. So if you have a matrix Y with entries YIJ, you first say the diagonal entries are all IID with some distribution. Then the pairs of entries, so for each one of these pairs off the diagonal, there's some IID random variable that produces pairs of numbers with some correlation. Um, and those pairs, that collection of pairs is, is, a, is another IID set. And then finally, you assume that the collection of all the random variables, the a diagonal and the the off-diagonal pairs, that's a set of independent, a collection of independent random variables. The result that, that, that was proven by here, O'Rourke, Renfrew, Shoshnikov, and Boo in 2014 is the following. So M, let M be bigger than 1, it's an integer. For K going between 1 and M, let each uh, random uh, matrix Y and K be a real elliptic random matrix. So here, we're, they're just, they just dealt with the real case for simplicity. Um, all entries are mean 0, variance 1. And have finite 2 plus epsilon moments. So one thing I'll point out here is this is distinct. When you deal with products, it's distinctly harder. Um, they need an additional moment condition. So in the circular law, the, the state of the art requires only second moment variance. But here, uh, they, they still need a little bit more to get the convergence. Assume also that the covariance is rho k. So rho k is the covariance for the elliptic matrix y k. They can all be different. But assume that they have absolute value less than 1. So in particular, this allows the IID case, so it covers, it you know, recovers these results by Goetz, Tikhomorov, and Oroch and Shoshnikov if you set all the rows equal to zero. It does not allow 
all the rows to be equal to one, which would be a product of Hermitian random matrices. But there's, there's a technical reason that doesn't work out, but it seems like it's, the result should probably be true in that case, but that's still an open question. Um, and then further assume these y k's are dependent. Then the conclusion, p is this product, so this is the scaling factor you need for a product of m of these matrices, n to that m over 2, y n 1 times all the way up to y n m. This has a limiting measure converging to this function, which, you know, you could check. It's the mth product, the mth power of the circular law. So this, if you want to check if m is, for example, over equal to 1, it would be just uh, 1 over pi uniformly. But when m is a higher power, this collects the eigenvalues a little more uh, towards the the origin. So this is, this is what is known, and it, it's uh, really interesting, I think, because here the ellipticity does not play any role in the final answer. So if these rows are all zero, or they're all one half, or there's some different numbers, you get the same limiting measure. The limiting measure is always the nth power, the nth product of the circular law, regardless of the ellipticity of the underlying matrices. And that includes the case where they are all IID matrices. Um, one other thing that, that these authors go further is they show that the same convergence holds even if each y and k is perturbed by a deterministic low rank matrix with small Hilbert Schmidt norm. So let me just say the, the perturbations. This is for Rourke, uh, N, Fuge, Ashikov, and Boo. Um, they're of the form, so A, N, they have the matrix 1 over root N, y, and k plus a n. Okay, so this is the, the product form k equals 1 to m for their perturbations. So here, this is more like uh, in Tau's perturbation. He added, added it to have set m, m equal to 1. It's the same type of perturbation there um, and different from the sample covariance case where we did multiplicative perturbations. So the bulk, the bulk convergence is the same, but of course bulk convergence misses microscopic features. So you could ask what about outliers? Are there outliers you can quantify and predict in this elliptic case? And uh, this is, leads to another uh, possible open question. So I think the answer is it, it's, you know, the result I think should be the same as in the IID case, but there are technical reasons why the IID case is the best we could do. So we're going to focus, instead of products of elliptical random matrices, just products of IID random matrices. And it is an open question whether that could be extended to the elliptical case. Now this is, this is the bulk distribution. Let's, let's talk about that microscopic feature. So first, the first thing you would prove, the first microscopic feature you might want to prove is that there are no outliers if there isn't a perturbation at all. And this was proven in the case uh, where the entries have sub exponential decay uh, by, by Nemesh in 2016. And then um, in 2018, this is joint work with, with Natalie Costin and Jean Rourke, we proved the following. So if m is at least 1, and x and 1 through x and m are independent complex IID random matrices, so we're not using ellipticity anymore, they're all, all just IID. Um, the entries are mean zero variance 1, they can, be, I can't be, they can be complex, but we additionally assume finite fourth moment, so that's, there's usually some additional moment condition necessary to get, um, to get the no outliers result. You know, this finite fourth moment you saw in, in Tau's result, in Arok Shoshnikov, in the sample covariance matrix result of, of mine and Sean's, we um, actually used, bound, we needed bounded moments of all orders, not just fourth moment. But here, we only need bounded fourth moment. And further, the real and imaginary parts um, are independent. And that's, again, I don't think this is a, a really important, the necessary feature probably, but it was, we needed it to get the proof to work. Then, if you look at this product, Pn is the product of all these uh, matrices scaled appropriately. It's the spectral radius is at most 1 plus the rule of 1 as n goes to infinity. So you expect to get a picture like this. So this is n equals 1,000 as usual. There are four real Gaussian matrices, um, 1,000 by 1,000, multiplied together, and they produce this. You can, the number's a little hard to read here, but this is, this is very close to tracing the unit disk, and it's concentrated towards the middle because it's the fourth power of the um, circular law. So that is a no outliers result, and let's look at a perturbation. So here is an example of a multiplicative perturbation. This is the same kind of perturbation that we used for the sample covariance case. So each matrix X is multiplied by a factor of the identity plus a n k, where this a n k matrix is a deterministic matrix with a constant bounded rank and operator norm. And uh, here's the picture we get. And what do we? Where, what do you notice about this picture? Looks almost exactly the same. 
Well, in fact, as I stated the theorem, it still has special radius at most one plus little o of one. So this is maybe maybe a surprise. So this these this, in this example, the matrices were rank five and operator norm two. They produced no outliers. And this is a, a funny feature. In the sample covariance case, this was a very natural way to get some, uh, some, good, some clear outliers. In the ID products case, this produces no outliers. So, and there's a, a good heuristic reason I can explain that in, in a bit. But so far, there are no outliers. So you might think, well, that's it. The talk is over. It turns out there are none. Outliers are, are not possible. But uh, this is a just dividing bar. I'm going to show you another picture with blue eigenvalues of a case where there are, 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 are outliers, and then I'll explain why on the next slide. So here, this is again four matrices. There's a different perturbation. You can see I've zoomed out a little bit so that the, uh, the unit disk is roughly here. There are these five outlier eigenvalues pretty clearly outlying. Each of them is uh, roughly 1.5 times the fifth root of unity. And so there is a perturbation that produces outliers. It's just not this multiplicative perturbation. So, uh, so the first minute, but we also know if there's no perturbation, there are no outliers. If there's a certain multiplicative perturbation, there's no outliers. There's a different perturbation we'll get to in the next slide that does produce outliers. So, so there are outliers. We can quantify them, and that'll be described in this next theorem here. So here's the result. For m at least 1, again, we have x and 1 through x and m are independent, complex, IID random matrices, mean zero variance 1, finite fourth moment as usual, and we still have our, our condition independent real and imaginary parts. The A's, these perturbation matrices, again, will be constant rank, constant operator norm, and we'll have this additional assumption. I didn't state the uh, other outlier results we saw on the second slide formally, but they generally have a constraint like this. Assume there's an epsilon bigger than zero, so that no eigenvalues, in this case, A with no second subscript is the product of all the A's. So assume that this A does not have any eigenvalues within three epsilon of the edge of the unit disk. And in the previous uh, outlier result, there was a similar condition, just because in order to see the outlier, the, the original eigenvalues had to be away from the unit disk um, in order to see it. So we just have this constraint. There are no eigenvalues that are right near the border of the unit disk. If A has J eigenvalues that are in this range outside of the unit disk, then this product, um, Pn, which is the product, K equals 1 to M, of our IID matrix scaled appropriately plus the perturbation. So this is the same kind of, of uh, the same kind of perturbation as was used by Aurora, Renfrew, Shostakov, and Vu, where they show that the elliptical or the ID case, that the limiting measure will still be the same under this perturbation. Um, we make we use that same perturbation. Then there are there are outlying eigenvalues. There are J eigenvalues that are lying at least two epsilon outside the unit disk, so they're a constant distance away from the unit disk. And each is within little o of one of the corresponding eigenvalue of an. And this is maybe not stated as exactly formally as it could be, but you can actually pair the eigenvalues up. You can find an eigenvalue of an. It matches. You can pair that with an eigenvalue of, of pn. And if there are two eigenvalues of an close together, there'll be two eigenvalues of pn right in the same region there. And so this is uh, this is the outlier result of the sort that we saw earlier. But now for products of matrices, um, this comes close to recovering tau's outlier result when m is 1, uh, the difference is we have this independent imaginary and real parts condition that is not in, in Tao's original result. Uh, but otherwise, it, it's the same kind of outlier plan. And the other thing I'll note about this is the second slide showed three types of outlier results. In the IID case, the, the eigenvalues matched the eigenvalues of perturbation. And we see that again here. So in the elliptical case, the eigenvalues of the perturbation were different from the outliers after the perturbation, and the same with sample covariance matrices. But here again, we see that they match up. That uh, even though we're looking at a product of the circular law, the eigenvalues match up with the, uh, the eigenvalues of the perturbation. Um, I will say that the same approach that we take for this result does work with some other variations. And this, is, this next line explains why you might expect to not have seen eigenvalues with a multiplicative perturbation. The general idea is if you look at some product like this, you can multiply it out. And when you multiply it out, you can group it into three parts. A product of the IID parts. This is the product of all the, the x's. A product of the constant matrices. That's the product of all the a and k's with, with just a n. And then this m n, the mixed terms that have some, some x terms and some a terms combined in some order. And the general uh, heuristic is that these mixed terms don't really affect the outliers. Uh, they don't have an effect on the, on the final, the microscopic feature of the outliers. So in the case where we use the multiplicative perturbation 
um, of the matrix, if we had a situation uh, where we, we looked at previously, where we had this uh, root n times x n k times the identity plus a n k, if you multiply this whole thing out, k equals 1 to m, every term, there'll be a term of just the x's at the beginning when you choose all the identity matrices, and, but every other term will be a mixed term. There's no term purely of constant matrices, and so that falls into the case where this a n is zero, and then you, you would not expect there to be uh, an outlying eigenvalue there. So that, that is our main result. We do get some outliers, and, um, and this, again, there's, there's three main steps to the proof that I'll go talk about on the next slide here, but one of the critical things, just like in the um, elliptical outliers result and in the sample covariance outliers result is an isotropic limit law. And so in this particular case, we're also going to be looking for an isotropic limit law. But let me first, let me first say one reason why this is tricky. So we had to deal with the IID case in order to get everything to work out. That's one of the simpler cases. You know, ellipticity reduces the independence a little bit, which makes things harder, but generally still possible, but we couldn't quite get that in this result. When you have products, it's much more complicated because when you multiply two matrices together, there's now these complicated sums of entries. So uh, entry in the product has inputs from a variety of different entries uh, in the original two factors, and there can be dependencies among the entries that are, that are present because of this, and that makes things possibly more complicated. Um, however, we have a, a possible way to deal with that um, in our first step of the proof, which is linear, linearization. So I'll be using these curly letters M to refer to block N by N matrices. So curly M is this humongous block uh, matrix. It is a M by M blocks, and each block is an N by N matrix. So it's an MN by MN matrix, this humongous matrix. And the M's are put in this circulant form. So there are zeros going down the diagonal, and then the blocks in the superdiagonal are M1 through MN minus 1, and then the lower the left entry is capital M, little m. Um, and we'll, we're into, let's say we're interested in the product. We want to know about this product matrix M1 times MN. That's our product matrix P. It turns out if you raise curly M to the mth power, little mth power, and take the characteristic polynomial there, it's equal to the characteristic polynomial of P raised to the mth power. And that's not too hard to see computationally. If you think of raising a circulant matrix to the mth power, you get a diagonal matrix, and you get this diagonal matrix where each entry in the diagonal looks like this or some cyclic permutation of that matrix, all of which have the same eigenvalues. So it, it's, uh, it's not, once you've, you've thought of this, it's not hard to see that it's true. But this really changes the problem, because now instead of having this complicated product with a lot of dependencies between, potential dependencies between the entries, we can work with these humongous block matrices where there is structure, certainly, and a lot of zeros, but inside each M, in our case, there'll be independent entries, IID entries inside of each M. So that, uh, that is a big simplification. The next simplification, and this goes back even to Tau's, uh, well, the formula is older still, but Sylvester's determinant formula is the following. It was used by Tau in his Cutler's result. If A is a capital N by K matrix, and we're thinking of capital N as being very large, and B is a K by capital N matrix, so these are both uh, highly rectangular matrices, then the determinant of the identity plus A times B is equal to the determinant of the identity plus B times A. It doesn't maybe look stunning at first, but this is in some ways remarkable. This determinant here is a capital N, a determinant of a capital N by capital N matrix. It's a humongous computation. This determinant is a K by K matrix. And we're thinking of K as being a constant, you know, like, like rank, you know, this three or, or 10 or something, whereas capital N is, is M times N, some humongous number. And so this really changes the character of the problem. Instead of looking at a determinant of a humongous matrix, we're looking at a determinant of a very small, easy to understand matrix because of our low rank assumption. So when, when uh, K is low rank, it's constant size, we can make these, we can decompose our perturbation matrix into matrices like A and B. So we turn this N by N determinant, or this should be capital N here, by capital N determinant into a K by K determinant. So that's the second big step. And the third step, this key step, is an isotropic limit law. And this is, uh, this is where the real work of the paper is. This is the sort of main, main hard work in the paper, but it, it's a, a critical part. This includes showing that there are no outliers and no, it, with, with no perturbation. And um, what a limit law does is it shows that the resolvent of a, this, this matrix, uh, characteristic polynomial of a certain matrix, 
is very close. It's a good approximation for the simple function minus 1 over z outside of the unit disk in any basis. So isotropic means basis independent. So in any basis, you can get this kind of uh, this good approximation for the resolvement as a simple function, as minus 1 over z. So as I mentioned, there's the, one of the first of these isotropic laws was by Knowles and Yin in 2012. And that was for Wigner matrices, so IID except for the Hermitian constraint. Um, I mentioned the sample covariance uh, isotropic limit law that, that Sean and I used in our um, outliers result. This was due to Blomendahl, Blomendahl, Erdish, Knowles, Yao, and Yin in 2014. And then also the elliptical local limit law by O'Rourke and Renfrew in 2014. And so the key step in our outliers for products is a new isotropic local law that works for matrices like this, for humongous block n by n structured matrices. So that is the, the key step. And um, now let me say a little bit about what, what that step looks like. So here is, here is a statement of the isotropic limit law. So um, curly y, let me just write that down on the board so we can see it. Curly y is going to be one of these block matrices this time with, uh, with the IID matrices in the uh, in the structured parts, the non-zero structured parts of the matrix. So there are these zero n by n blocks going to the diagonal. There is uh, y n one all the way down to y n m minus one, and in the lower left is y n m. So the circulant structure uh, for the matrix, and the only non-zero blocks are these these y these i i d. Oh, I should make them x's. That's they're x's in the theorem. I'll change them all to x's. The ID matrices X, and then curly G. So I guess uh, first we have our usual assumptions: mean zero variance one, finite fourth moment. Then our additional assumption: independent real and imaginary parts. Curly G here is the resolvent, so it is the inverse of the scaled version. And this is this is the right scaling for curly Y because uh, one of root n goes to scale each of the different different blocks inside um, minus the I take the inverse. So that is our resolvent that we want to find a good approximation for. And this is our conclusion. For any delta at least zero, almost surely for n sufficiently large, all the eigenvalues of one over root n curly y n are within delta of the unit disk. So that right there is the no outliers result. Our first microscopic feature that says that just this block matrix, which we remember from linearization is a proxy for the eigenvalues of our product, they're all within delta of the unit disk, some constant. We can choose the constant of the unit disk. So that's the first thing. The second thing, critical feature, is a singular values bound. So when we take the uh, inverse of this matrix, the smallest singular value becomes the largest. And now we're talking about bounding the largest singular value of the resolvent, which is the same as bounding the smallest of our original matrix. And we show what in this isotropic law we need is a uniform in Z. So for any Z outside of the unit disk, we have this bound. And it's bounded. Uh, it's, by, it's a constant bound. Um, uniform over all z. So that is the uh, control of the smallest singular value. And then last, the critical thing, if we take vectors un of vn, complex unit vectors of length mn, then this quantity, the supremum over all z out of the unit disk, of our resolvent multiplied on the right and the left by these vectors u, compared to um, 1 over z times the same two vectors multiplied together, that goes to 0 almost surely as n goes to infinity. So if we were in a case where u and v were just standard basis vectors, this would be just a, reg a regular uh, limit law, not, not an isotropic. But we're allowed here to choose any basis. So conjugating with vectors on either side, any vectors gives us the same good approximation for, um, for the resolvent. So you can kind of think of this, essentially, we're saying g, g n of z, is very close to negative 1 over z when, when you do this conjugation, because when you add them together, uh, you get 0. So that's, that's what these, these isotropic limit laws look like. This is you know, it's a similar form to what was proven, proven in previous ones, but now for this more general case of curly y, uh, these block matrices. And I can show, what I want to give you is a very brief sketch of how you'd go from this isotropic law to the actual outliers, the placement of the outliers. So, it's, it fits on the rest of the slide. It's not, at least in the sketch form, not so hard. Once you have the isotropic limit law, you want to know what's going on to the eigenvalues outside of the unit disk. So if z is not in the unit disk, then it's an eigenvalue for 
this perturbed matrix, one over uh, n times curly y plus so curly a, uh, as you might expect, curly a n will be the same block form um, for the a perturbation matrix matrices a n one down to a n m minus one with a n m in the lower corner. So this is that same block m n by m n matrix. But now this is for our low rank perturbations. It's still low rank. It's just a bigger matrix. Um, it's an eigenvalue for this perturbed curly y if this determinant is equal to zero. So that's not a hard thing to see. If you imagine looking at the characteristic polynomial for this matrix here and then multiplying through by the resolvent, you can simplify a little bit to get to this exact form. It's the determinant of the identity plus the resolvent curly g times curly a of n equal to zero. So uh, what do you think when you see this determinant of identity plus something? Who's thinking Sylvester's determinant formula? Anybody? That, I'm thinking that because A is a low rank matrix, and that means you can decompose A in the following way. It's uh, B times C, where B is MN by K, so K is again a very small number, and C is K by MN. So B is, and that's, that's, this just says what the size of B is and C is. So that's, that's very useful. Because of this, with Sylvester's determinant formula, we can take A and split it apart into this form, so we, we switch C to the other side, and now we're in the case of a K by K determinant, and that's very useful because this formula here is essentially G multiplied on the left and the right by a finite you know, bounded number, a constant number of vectors. Because this is a K by K determinant now, we can, we can actually write out the pieces by having G on the left and right by complex vectors of some sort, and then we can use our isotropic limit law to say that G is really pretty close to minus 1 over z when it's, con when it's multiplied from left to right in that way. So I've replaced g by minus 1 over z and added an error term here. That's the isotropic limit law at work. And this is a lot simpler. This complicated object, the resolvent, what we're trying to do to, to deal with it, this inverse of a humongous matrix, it's now been replaced with a simple function, 1 over z. We can replace, uh, we can apply Sylvester's determinant formula again to get back to A, and now we're in very good shape. This determinant is the computable explicitly. If we know the eigen, in terms of the eigenvalues of A, I mean, we've, if you take the eigenvalues of A and multiply it by one over Z, that moves eigenvalues by one over Z. You translate by the identity matrix, it translates the eigenvalues by, by one. So this characteristic polynomial is exactly the product written here. It's the product as J goes from one to K, where K is the number of, is the rank of curly A, one minus one over Z times the eigenvalue, the Jth eigenvalue of curly A, plus this error. And now what we've shown is that the eigenvalues outside the disk of this perturbed matrix are exactly the cases where this expression is zero, well, ignoring the error for a little bit. Well, this is pretty clearly zero exactly when z is equal to lambda j a n, exactly when z is, is the, takes the eigen, same value as the eigenvalue of curly a. And so that shows the placement of the eigenvalues. And the last thing you can do is use Roche's theorem to show that in a, a little old one region around the eigenvalue of a, you must have the, the eigenvalue of this perturbed uh, block matrix that we're looking at. And that's really it. Now, this, uh, this giant block matrix was uh, quantified, our eigenvalues of the product, and so now you can pass back to the product and get, get the result we wanted. So that is how you move from the isotropic limit law to the outliers type result. And um, this is the same kind of approach that, that you could use in the elliptical case that Rourke Manfred could use or that, that Sean and I used in the sample covariance case. The formula in here is, is, is different. It depends on the Stochys transform whether you get one over z or something more complicated, but it's the same, this, these steps in general, the same final steps you can have, you can take once you have an isotropic limit law in hand. So um, this is the work of the paper proving this law. I'll maybe spend uh, a few minutes just saying how this law is proved. What, what did we do to prove it? So there are uh, four main steps I wanted to highlight. First, the truncation step. We just wanted things to have finite tails, so you pick some large constant um, and recenter. We needed to work separately on the real and imaginary parts because to bound the small singular value, we needed the real and imaginary parts independence. So we truncated, we had to preserve that independence there. And we also wanted to maintain variance near one and uh, preserve up the constant for the fourth moment. Next is bounding the least singular value bound. And we want this to be uniform over all z outside of the disk. You can ver and then verify that this pass passes back to the non-truncated case. And this is one of the big steps. Instead of proving the isotropic law directly, it's easier to prove a version of the isotropic law in expectation. Um, and to do that, first you need to show that this expected value of the resolvent multiplied by vectors is close to 
just the resolvent multiplied by those same vectors. And that's all happening in the truncated case. So you need to show concentration of binary linear forms like these around their mean. Um, and then, then if that, you show good concentration, you could prove this, uh, this average version of isotropic limit law um, to get, uh, to get the, the, the general rule here. And this, I say this is also a supremum over sigma naught. We can also restrict the, rate, the, the range of z we're dealing with and use some uh, complex, elementary complex analysis to show that that expands the whole region we want to, want to deal with. And the last thing, uh, moment computations. This is a little bit, you know, it, it harkens back to what Bordenov was telling us for how to prove the semicircle law. But you can show now finally when we're looking to prove this average truncated version of the limit law, you can use moment computations to do that, but it's complicated because now there's this list of matrices being multiplied together, so you need to carefully track which, uh, which terms give you non-zero uh, values in this long, uh, long computation. So there's, there's a, a bit of graph theory and combinatorics where we're tracing paths and graphs and, and, and counting everything up carefully to actually show that this, this um, error term converges to zero to, to get the convergence we need. And that's really, uh, that is the main steps to proof. I'm not going to go deeper into than that. I'll mention uh, a few open questions I mentioned uh, earlier. So one, you know, can you take this approach and turn it into something for elliptical matrices. The thing for, for our work to show this concentration result of bilinear forms and the moment computations, we used, a, we used independence a lot in those cases. So we really used independence for three and four of the entries, a uh, substantial amount there, and that would need to be adjusted or some new idea accounted for to sort of be extended to elliptical matrices. And the other thing I'll mention, this is this open question about what the bulk distribution is. In the products of elliptical matrices, if you push the, uh, Covariance all the way to one, so the product of the Hermitian matrices. Do you still get the? Can you prove that you get the product of the, the, the circular law? And this was um, Rock, Renfrew, Shostakov, and Bu can do this for two, for two matrices that are both Hermitian, but it, the, it does not continue to work for three and, and larger. So that's a, another open question that might be of interest. And that's where I'll stop. Thank you very much. Yeah, so I know, um, I think there, the free probability has, has mentioned as a, as a route to getting the bulk measure uh, in, a couple, in, in some papers. I know in this um, Rourke, uh, Renfrew, Shostakov blue paper, they talk about how you could you know, predict a little bit what what's the, the bulk limiting measure will be using free probability. But I'm not, um, I don't know enough about it to know whether it's, it can zoom in and pick out these microscopic features. That's, uh, that's I, I have not. Uh, yeah, I don't know if that, I'm not sure if that, would, if that would work there. But that, I mean, one, I guess it could be a good idea. Free probability is a great way of organizing kind of a lot of, it's, it, you can think of free probability in some sense as a way of organizing all the moment computations together, almost like a generating function. And um, that could be a way of, of simplifying the analysis, possibly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so that's, that's a great question. So if you, um, let me go back to one of these. Could you quantify, here, one more back. Right, so each of these eigenvalues is pinned down to little of one. Could you quantify um, how big the fluctuation is? And I don't recall the results showing exactly what the quantification is. If you look at a lot of data for it, it seems like it does vary with the, um, with the model you're using. Like in particular, the sample covariance model, it seemed to be be more, you know, a, a greater spread than in the IID case. But I don't know exactly. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not, I'm not familiar with the result that that gives that quantifies what that that uh, that is. I mean, there are. I guess there is results. There are some results that on the fluctuations of these eigenvalues that kind of will tell you a little bit of how they're moving around. And I guess that could be pulled back to. Uh, ah. Ah, I see. I see, I see. Interesting. So if you imagine looking at the bulk where things are spread out uniformly, you could wonder if it was a fine enough grain, uh, fine enough control that you could see an, a mis an eigenvalue stuck in the middle. Yeah, I don't know if it's, it's I mean, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm, I'm really not sure about that. That's, a, that's an interesting idea, though. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the if you if you wanted to, yeah, so can you you could let me go back to the determinant resolvent computation. So here in this computation, you could ask what would happen if you had done instead of the additive perturbation here, you've done the multiplicative perturbation. And you can carry this through, I think. So I, this is a, I actually checked this in the sample covariance case. In the sample covariance case, we did the multiplicative perturbation. But you could also do an additive perturbation in the sample covariance case. And the computation goes through for the sample covariance matrices both times, and it gives you different placement of the outliers. Um, in the end, the, the last step you're doing here is you're essentially solving this equal to z, you're solving this equation for z. And so if you had a multiplicative perturbation in here to begin with, my sense is that when you pass to the resolvent, um, the multiplicative per perturbation would leave you with something where you, where you could not solve for z. Where that you, um, you know, at, at the end of this, at the very end, you have some simple function. You have the, the place of the eigenvalues and you have z. You want to solve for z in terms of these lambdas. And um, if you had a multiplicative perturbation, my sense is when you plugged it in here, you would find that it's a it's a, a, it does not give you a solution for z that's outside the, that, that is outside the disk anymore. And that that's why, uh, that's why you did this computation would then show that there's, there is no outlying eigenvalue that satisfies this exiting the, the unit disk condition. Mm -hmm. Ah, interesting. I see. So they assumed instead of, I guess, so instead of this um, finite fourth moment, they assumed that the 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 distribution of the entries was symmetric about zero. I see. So like a, I see, symmetric about zero. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, we, so the, the main, in, in the computations, you know, to show that we have no outliers, and there's this, there are these error computations where you need to show that something dis disappears. It's possible that this other alternate condition, that some kind of symmetry on the, the um, measures would lead to but similar, you know, cancellation that was sufficient. Um, that's, yeah, that seems that does seem possible. Though I've not, yeah, I've not, I've not checked that. And it's it's a still a little. I often wonder whether this could be removed entirely. Whether you could say, you know, actually find at second moment, you could somehow develop the cancellation, show the cancellation exists to really still get the same result. And it's okay as well. They conjecture I see because yeah, it's, I mean, when I've looked at, at data, you know, if you if you you push against this condition, the outliers results still seem robust. So that's interesting. They conjecture that this weaker condition, just symmetric about zero, is enough, but maybe even less is possible. Interesting. Okay.